thank you very much for your kind presentation. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here at this prestigious university. I have to say that I just arrived at uh, 5.30 a.m. today uh, to Hyderabad. This is my first time not only in Hyderabad, but in India. So although, obviously, uh, I have been in contact with many Indian colleagues all around uh, the world and during my entire career. I also had Indian students in Geneva. I know the contribution of your country to the development of international law. I will have the opportunity to refer to this uh, in our inaugural session on Sunday. You are kindly invited to attend this uh, inaugural session in this building. So, um, and today uh, I would like to address a very specific question uh, concerning maritime delimitations and maritime delimitations in the context of decolonization. These are the two areas I will address uh, today. Um, and the, the title of this presentation is precisely Uti Posidetis and Maritime Delimitations. I did have the opportunity to discuss, discuss with my colleague um, how far you went in matters of maritime delimitations or questions concerning territorial sovereignty, uh, territorial disputes, boundary delimitation, land or maritime binary delimitations. De um, but um, I would like to introduce uh, this uh, subject uh, speaking about the uh, Uti Posidetis uh, principle. Uti Posidetis, as you may know, is a Latin expression. Uh, the original uh, terminology was Uti Posidetis Ita Posidetis, which means as you, as you possess, you will continue to possess. And that was the idea that uh, emerged in Latin America at uh, the beginning of the 19th century. Indeed, one can say that um, the Latin America fight for independence was the first real process of decolonization. It was in the 19th century. And obviously the word even decolonization didn't exist at that time. And the fight for independence uh, was done in the particular circumstance in which international law was not the same legal system as it is today. Today we live in a, in a, in a world in which uh, all um, peoples uh, are entitled to rights and all are part of the international community. At that time, it was a rather European-centric uh, international law. So the fight for independence uh, was done in Latin America not with the support of international law, as it was the case uh, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, but uh, with the idea from Latin America to develop international law. And this is the reason why the Latin American countries developed this, what was a first regional rule, which was called Uti Posidetis, and as I said, the meaning is, as you possess, you will continue to possess. In other words, the idea of Uti Posidetis is the, the fact that when you achieve independence, your territory will be the same as it was during colonial times. This is the very core of the idea of Uti Posidetis. And uh, in this regard, the Hispanic American countries developed the idea that legal titles prevailed over effective possession. What was the idea? Effective possession is also related to the idea of the prevalence of force. If you have the possibility to impose a de facto situation, then uh, the point of view of Latin America was that it was not 
might that would prevail, but rather right. That is the idea also of uti posidetis, which is also called uti posidetis iuris, precisely in order to give prominence to a legal title instead of effectiveness. And the question I will raise here is not the applicability of uti posidetis in general, it was conceived to be applied in land. Uh, here I will discuss the possibility of applying this rule equally to maritime delimitation. Mm? And this is a more problematic point. Why? Because if you think about the, the existing international law at the 19th century, at that time there were territorial waters and then the high seas and not, no other maritime areas. Mm? Today, we know there are many different maritime areas. You have internal waters, you have the territorial sea, you have the EEZ, the Economic Exclusive Zone, the continental shelf, the high seas, and also the zone, that is to say, uh, the seabed beyond national jurisdiction. So all these different maritime areas, of course, didn't exist during the 19th century. You only have territorial sea. And furthermore, the length of the territorial sea was very limited at that time. It was not like uh, today, which is considered to be uh, 12 nautical miles. So the question is whether we can apply this rule, that is to say, the extent of your maritime areas, as it was during colonial times, will be the extent of your maritime areas after colonial times. Is it possible to apply it in the same manner for land and for the maritime areas? That's the question of today. And I will distinguish the situation in Latin America, as I said, a decolonization process which took about uh, two centuries ago, in Africa, when the process of independence uh, started in the second half of the 20th century, and even recently, the question also arose with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, because uh, there were maritime boundaries uh, established by the Soviet Union or by the former so uh, Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and the question was whether these maritime boundaries will continue to exist after the collapse of these two federations. So let's start with uh, Latin America. So I will refer in particular to the practice, that is to say, when this problem that I mentioned here uh, arose in uh, disputes before uh, arbitral tribunals or before the International Court of Justice. I will refer to these particular cases. Um, uh, in Latin America, the discussion uh, in this context, right? I mean in the context of um, arbitral uh, um, tribunals or the ICJ, arose uh, in uh, three different cases in particular. Mm? One is the Beagle Channel, which was a case between Argentina and Chile. The other, one, the other one was the Gulf of Fonseca in Central America, between El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. And the third and more recent case was the case concerning the maritime delimitation between Nicaragua and Honduras. It was a case brought before the International Court of Justice. So here you have the Beagle Channel case. It was a a land and a maritime case uh, at the very southernmost part of South America. So this is uh, the, the extreme south of South America. So if you go uh, further south, you will meet Antarctica. It's just uh, 1,000 kilometers south of uh, this area. And the question here, with the question that concerns our topic, eh, that is to say whether uti possibilities was applicable or not, was due to the fact that Argentina 
invoked Houthi possibilities even for maritime jurisdiction. The position of Argentina was that uh, during colonial times, Spain uh, had established that the jurisdiction over the Atlantic corresponded to the vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata, which was the predecessor of Argentina. And the uh, maritime jurisdiction over the Pacific Ocean to the captains, Captaincy General of Chile, which is the predecessor of Chile. That was the position of Argentina. In other words, Argentina invoked the Utiposidetis for the maritime delimitation. The arbitral tribunal, which was constituted by the Queen of England, rejected this position and did not consider that Argentina had demonstrated the existence of such a rule dividing the maritime jurisdiction Atlantic for the vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata and Pacific for the Captaincy General of Chile. So it was not a matter of the application or not of the rule but a, a question of evidence. According to the tribunal, Argentina failed to demonstrate the existence of such division during colonial times. The second point is, second case is the Gulf of Fonseca. You have here the Gulf of Fonseca. It is on the Pacific coast of Central America. So you have here a Gulf in which there are some islands which were also disputed. Uh, and there was a case between El Salvador and Honduras before the ICJ and Nicaragua requesting, requested permission to intervene because it was one of the repairs of the Gulf. And the two parties to the case, El Salvador and Honduras, requested the Chamber of the Court to determine the legal status of the Gulf of Fonseca. And here again, it is interesting that there was a first decision by the first ever international court that, that was created in all over the world, which was the Central American Court of Justice. The Central American Court of Justice was created in 1907 uh, among the uh, five uh, Central American countries. And the Central American Court of Justice, analyzing the status of the Gulf, declared that this was uh, an historic bay. Mm? That is to say the waters in historic bays are considered to be internal waters. And this was so because, according to the Central American Court of Justice, Spain, when it conquered uh, uh, Central America, it considered that that was an historic bay. So the uh, freely, newly independent states of Central America inherited this um, title. That is to say, after the independence, the bay continue to be an historic bay and the three uh, Latin American Republican states could also claim the same right as Spain had during colonial times. This position was, was ratified by the chamber of the ICJ. So the, the chamber had to analyze the legal status and it came to the same conclusion. And the, and the chamber mentioned the fact that the uh, three Central American states inherited the uh, right of Spain in this uh, regard. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because here it's not a problem of maritime delimitation, but it's a problem of the legal characterization of, the, of a given maritime area. Mm -hmm. It was not in a question of the limitation between Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, but to consider that they had the same right the colonial power had previously. Um, there is also another interesting point with regard to um, state succession, because during colonial times, uh, Spain and Great Britain 
concluded an agreement at the end of the 18th century, in 1719 more precisely, uh, by which Great Britain recognized Spanish jurisdiction over 10, 10 nautical miles all along the coast of uh, the then Hispanic America. So one could consider that once independence uh, arrived, the Hispanic American countries also inherited this vis-a-vis -vis the United Kingdom. Um, this point was not uh, discussed before the ICJ, but I, I think it is worth mentioning. And the third case that was discussed uh, with regard to the applicability of UT possibilities to maritime delimitations or maritime areas was the uh, maritime dispute between uh, Nicaragua and Honduras. That was a case brought before the ICJ, as I said. Here is the Caribbean Sea. Hmm? And here you have And you have in front of you the Nicaraguan claim of the maritime delimitation and the Honduras claim here. The position of Honduras was that uh, during uh, colonial times, there was a de facto uh, maritime delimitation between the two provinces. Both of them were part of uh, the Spanish Empire at that time. But according to Honduras, there was a delimitation of jurisdiction, of maritime jurisdiction, which was decided on the basis of this uh, parallel. This is the 15th parallel. According to Honduras, that was the delimitation of the maritime jurisdiction of the two provinces during colonial times. The position of Nicaragua was to reject that. Um, Nicaragua casted some doubts about the applicability of UT possibilities, although later on in the same case, it argued that it, it is possible to apply UT possibilities to maritime areas, but in the particular case, there was not such a delimitation. Spain did not establish any kind of uh, delimitation of the maritime jurisdiction of the different provinces in Central America. And the ICJ um, came to the conclusion that it could be possible to invoke UTI uh, for the delimitation of maritime areas, but in this context there was not, uh, no evidence that Spain during colonial time had established such a maritime delimitation. So one can conclude, with regard to the practice of Latin America, that it is accepted that UTI possibilities could be applicable to maritime areas. But what is the problem? As I said at the very beginning, in the 19th century, the only maritime area under national jurisdiction was the territorial sea. So it's impossible if you have to delimit the continental shelf or the EZ or fishery zones between Latin American countries, obviously there is no uh, delimitation to inherit because these areas didn't exist in colonial times. So the situation is a little bit different in Africa for the simple reason that uh, the decolonization in Africa arrived uh, much later. Arrived, uh, as I said, in the second half of the 20th century. And in the second half of the 20th century, there existed the continental shelf. One can say that uh, for some, since the Truman Proclamation of the Continental Shelf in 1945, this maritime area existed. And then, uh, during the 70s, uh, particularly after 82, with the adoption of the Conve United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, there exists also the EEZ. So, in the African context, it's more possible, I would say, 
to invoke UT possibilities for the maritime delimitations not only of the territorial sea but also other maritime areas. And here we have to distinguish two different things. I don't know whether you can see the map, it's a little bit difficult. Um, but I can tell you what you have in front of you. As this is uh, this is a map uh, of uh, what was at that time Portuguese Guinea and uh, French colonies what, of what is Senegal today in the north and uh, Guinea uh, Conakry in the south. Mm? And the question uh, was uh, whether a delimitation uh, concluded between Portugal and France was applicable or not uh, to the newly independent states of Africa. And here there were two different arbitral awards. One was Guinea, Guinea Bissau. And the other was uh, Guinea Bissau, Senegal. Mm? So, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Senegal. In Guinea, Guinea Bissau, there was a line that was established in a treaty between France and uh, uh, Portugal during colonial times. You cannot see it, but I can show you. There is a line here, maybe you see it. There is a line in the sea. And there are some islands here, and some islands beyond the land. The question was, is this line a maritime delimitation line or not? It's a matter of interpretation, of course, of the treaty. Because you have to distinguish uh, two different types of uh, lines. One is a maritime delimitation line, and another thing is what it is called a, an allocation line. Sometimes these lines are established not with the purpose of establishing a maritime delimitation, but with the purpose of just allocating islands existing in that maritime area. And that was the purpose of this line. That was not a maritime delimitation, but it was simply an allocation line. It means that the, island, the islands inside this uh, difficult to say a triangle, but more or less, <laughs> uh, belong to, belonged to, to Portugal during colonial times, and the islands beyond that line to France. That was the only idea of establishing this line. Consequently, this cannot be considered a maritime delimitation, and the newly independent states cannot consider that that line was the maritime delimitation. Okay? Then you have another case, which is Guinea-Bissau, Senegal. And that was an arbitral award of 1989. The prior one was 1985. Here we have a different situation. Why? Because in 1960, so some, some time before independence, uh, Portugal and France established a maritime delimit a true maritime delimitation agreement. But this agreement divided the territorial sea, the continuous zone, and the continental shelf. And the question before the arbitral tribunal was whether the maritime delimitation established by Portugal and France was applicable to the newly independent states of Guinea-Bissau and Senegal. And the answer of the tribunal was it is in French because the arbitrary word is in French, and I take advantage of this to encourage you to learn French. Because uh, you know the working languages of uh, the ICJ, 
Hitler's are both English and French. And my strong advice to my students and to students from all over the world is that at least you must have a passive knowledge of French. I hope the message, the message has passed. I come back to the case. <laughs> so I can translate you what the arbitral tribunal decided. The arbitral tribunal decided that the might and the limitation established by Portugal and France is applicable to Guinea Bissau and Senegal, but only with regard to the maritime areas explicitly mentioned in the treaty between uh, France and Portugal. That is to say, territorial sea, continuous zone, and economic uh, and continental shelf. In other words, the water column above the continental shelf was not delimited by uh, France and Portugal because at that time the EEZ didn't exist. And consequently, there was no UTI possibilities to be applicable. That was the position of the uh, arbitral award. Mm -hmm. Well, Mohamed Bejawi, who was uh, one of the arbitrators in this case, and who also was a, a former president of the ICJ, voted against that because he considered that um, UTI possibilities is applicable to land but not to maritime areas because they are two different um, uh, spaces deserving different treatment. Um, well, Judge Bejawi is a member of the Institute of International Law. <laughs> Unfortunately, he will not come, but he is an honorary member, so he is not obliged to come anymore. Um, um, I, I disagree with this point of view. Obviously, maritime areas and land are different spaces, deserving different treatment. As you know, you have sovereignty over land. You also have sovereignty over the territorial sea, but you don't have sovereignty over the EZ or the continental shelf. So there are different legal regimes applicable. That's fine, that's true. But the idea of footy possibilities is to preserve the heritage of the newly independent states and to offer stability and to avoid, uh, uh, you say in English, fratricid uh, fights. So that is to say, to avoid that after independence, uh, conflict um, arises uh, between the newly independent states. This is the idea of UD Positive stability. And as you know, Article 62 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaty of Treaties, uh, which contains the fundamental change of circumstances clause, um, Regus Six Stantius clause, contains also an exception. You cannot invoke the fundamental change of circumstance if uh, the treaty concern a uh, delimitation. And this is equally applicable to land delimitation or to maritime delimitation. This is what the court said in the Aegean uh, Sea Continental Shelf case between Greece and Turkey. And here is the same idea, that is to say, even though there are different uh, regimes applicable to these different spaces, the, the core of the idea of UTI possibilities is stability and to preserve the heritage after independence. And this, is, this can be equally applicable to both land and maritime areas. This is my point of view. The question was also discussed in the continental shelf Tunisia, Libya, about not a boundary a formal one, but in de facto uh, boundary delimitation. Mm -hmm. Because during colonial times, Italy and France uh, had a kind of modus vivendi. So they extended their juris respective jurisdiction to a given line. And the question was whether the court 
in deciding the maritime delimitation of the continental shelf between Tunisia and Libya should also respect this modus operandi. And the position of the court was yes, it could. And some of the judges, such as the Italian judge Roberto Ado or the Uruguayan judge Jiménez de Arechaga, they explicitly invoke this rule. And now I'm come to the last geographic area in which the UT possibilities was applicable. And that was, uh, I will not mention the Soviet Union uh, for questions of time, but I will refer to the very last arbitral award. It was done just uh, two months ago. Uh, it's an arbitral award between Croatia and Slovenia. The task of the arbitral tribunal was to determine parts of the land boundary and also the maritime uh, boundary between these two former uh, Yugoslav republics. And the question again arose whether UTI possibilities was or not applicable. The tribunal applied without any hesitation UTI possibilities to the uh, land boundary. And with regard to the maritime boundary, there was a very interesting situation because the Gulf of Tehran should be delimited, the Bay of Tehran should be delimited. Here it is. And as you, as you know, so the, the waters of the bay are considered under certain conditions, you may find in the United Nations Con Convention of the Law of the Sea, the waters inside the closing line are internal waters. And the tribunal considered that in internal waters, the applicable rules are the same of land delimitation. And the tribunal considered that uh, first it had to seek whether there were, in accordance with UT possibilities, there was a delimitation during uh, the time of the former uh, Yugoslavia. Mm? That is to say, between the then uh, socialist republics of Slovenia and Croatia. And the tribunal came to the conclusion that there was not such a administrative delimitation during the times of the former Yugoslavia. And then it referred to what is called in French, even in English, the, sometimes you use French words, effectivity, that is to say effectiveness, if you prefer to use the English word. That is to say, here you also have a case in which UTI possibilities was applied. To conclude, just to give you the possibility to raise questions or make comments, um, in the field of maritime delimitation or in the field of the law of the sea in general, what is the interest or the relevance of UT possibilities? First, as we saw in particular in the context of Latin America, for the determination of maritime zones and in particular historic waters. And this is what we saw with regard to the Gulf of Fonseca and this is also what we saw very recently with regard to, with regard to the Bay of Tiran in the case between Croatia and Slovenia. Second possibility is for the succession to treaties establishing maritime boundaries. That is to say, when you have maritime delimitations agreements concluded between uh, colonial powers, then you can apply them after the independence. Insofar, I insist, as these treaties really delimited the uh, ex today existing maritime areas. Hmm? And then, as we saw from the uh, Tunisia-Libya case, also for the succession to uh, the limitation of tacit agreements between predecessors or states, in particular the, these kind of de facto arrangements as we saw in Tunisia, Libya. These, the really independent states can also invoke the succession to this particular situation. So this is the picture that I try to 
present before you in order to demonstrate that this uh, rule, which is a Latin American rule, uh, had reached a universal character and is also applicable in the maritime delimitation context. Thank you very much.